Just like the atmosphere becomes a sink for carbon dioxide as carbon dioxide accumulates in the atmosphere, so too can carbon dioxide accumulate in aquatic systems. Here we'll briefly cover marine sinks for carbon dioxide. The ocean removes CO2 from the atmosphere through dissolution in seawater and photosynthesis by marine organisms. And earlier we had talked about the two pumps, the biological pump and the solubility pump, to move carbon down into deeper waters from the shallow waters. And here we'll take a look at some of those, some of the chemistry of that. The solubility of CO2, we had covered a little bit earlier, but essentially when CO2 and water come together and CO2 dissolves in water, we can also form carbonic acid. And that carbonic acid produces acid, acidity, protons, as well as carbonates and bicarbonate. So we have bicarbonate here, we have carbonate here, and these are in equilibrium with one another. So the more CO2 that you pump in to water through different mechanisms, the more this reaction goes to the right and the more bicarbonate and carbonate you get. This in a certain sense can be thought of as beneficial because we're taking CO2 and storing it in water instead of the atmosphere, but it also generates acidity and it generates protons. The consequence for that, the main consequence, is that a lot of structures in the ocean are built off of calcium carbonate. When we take calcium carbonate, it can dissolve in water and become bicarbonate. And so the acidity associated with bicarbonate reactions actually can dissolve calcium carbonate and form bicarbonate. This rising ocean acidity dissolves calcium carbonate and that has very important consequences for a large number of organisms. Lobsters, oysters, corals, other things like diatoms actually use calcium carbonate for their shells or exoskeletons. So oysters, for example, their shells are mostly calcium carbonate and corals have a calcium carbonate structure that they work with too. Lobsters tend to use chitin for their exoskeleton but embedded within that chitin is also calcium carbonate. And the less available calcium carbonate is or the more likely it is to dissolve, the less these organisms are able to build these structures and the more susceptible they are to damage. So all of that extra CO2 that's being stored in ocean waters, for example, really reduce, well, increase the the dissolution of calcium carbonate and make it harder for these organisms to form structures. Having covered marine sinks for CO2, we'll now turn our attention to terrestrial sinks for carbon dioxide. <clears throat> Land use change, CO2 fertilization, nitrogen deposition, and various climate effects contribute, contribute to the terrestrial sink for CO2. So what this statement is, is that there's a net sink for carbon dioxide in the terrestrial ecosystems of the world. And those are being driven by a number of factors, land use change, carbon dioxide fertilization of photosynthesis, nitrogen deposition, and a number of climate effects are what's causing the vegetation of the world and terrestrial ecosystems of the world to take up more carbon dioxide than they're releasing. When we take a look at this global carbon cycle figure, figure 14.5, you can see that here there's a separate term for the land sink, which is 2.8 petagrams of carbon per year. And if you look, here's NPP versus respiration, heterotrophic respiration, and there's more net primary productivity than there is heter heterotrophic respiration. And so in that sense, terrestrial ecosystems are taking up more carbon than they're releasing into the atmosphere on an annual basis. Some of this is due to forest regrowth. There were a lot of forests that were cut down in the late 1800s and early 1900s, for example, in North America, and these have been allowed to regrow. And that forest regrowth takes up carbon and holds on to it as plants produce wood and that wood stays in the system. So that's a net sink for carbon. In addition, there's direct CO2 enhancement of photosynthesis. So carbon dioxide, by having higher CO2 levels, is going to give us higher photosynthesis. And we've talked about how we can look at curves between photosynthetic rates and something like carbon dioxide concentrations. In addition, having a more CO2 in the atmosphere decreases stomatal conductance of water. And that leaves more water in the soil and often allows photosynthesis to extend further into dry periods. <clears throat> 
So carbon dioxide can enhance photosynthesis and that increases the amount of carbon that vegetation takes up. We also have nitrogen addition that serves to increase the productivity of ecosystems and the absor net absorption of carbon. So nitrogen addition stimulates photosynthesis. We know that it's a limiting factor in ecosystems all throughout the world. We're gonna, when you add nitrogen, you have higher photosynthetic rates for an individual leaf, and we also have higher leaf area. And that net stimulation of photosynthesis increases productivity, increases the uptake of carbon, and on a net basis, leads to greater carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere than if we didn't have nitrogen deposition. In addition, Nitrogen deposition reduces decomposition. So having higher N availability can have a reduction in decomposition rates. And we talked about this before. On a net basis though, the earth is getting warmer. So the increasing CO2 concentrations lead to warmer temperatures. And warmer temperatures can lead to increased decomposition. So we have NPP going into the system. We have heterotrophic respiration coming out of the system. And we can probably put this as GPP. And the balance between the two, in part, depends on temperatures. Warmer temperatures lead to increased decomposition. The balance of all these factors, for example, in part, depends on the fate of nitrogen. Not necessarily deposited nitrogen, but nitrogen that's in the system already. And essentially, it's when temperatures increase, for example, and we're going to get more decomposition, that that increases the availability of nitrogen in the ecosystem as CO2 leaves. And so there's that nitrogen that was in the organic matter then becomes available. If the nitrogen that's in that system is lost from that system either by leaching or gaseous nitrogen loss, then <clears throat> warming is going to decrease carbon storage. But if that nitrogen is transferred from the soil to vegetation and leads to an increase in productivity, there's a potential for greater carbon storage. And the way to think about this is thinking about C to N ratios. So the carbon to nitrogen ratio of soil organic matter on a global basis is approximately 14 to one. So for each unit of nitrogen in soil organic matter, you're gonna store 14 units of carbon. But in vegetation, the average C to N ratio is roughly 160 to one. So for one, unit of nitrogen, you're going to store 160 units of carbon. If we take nitrogen from the soil and transfer that to vegetation, the nitrogen in the soil, we said, is going to store 14 units of carbon. So you lose those 14 units of carbon to the atmosphere. But if the nitrogen is taken up and used for greater productivity, you then store 160 car units of carbon. That difference is a net gain of 146 units of carbon. So just by knowing the differences in C to N ratios of soils and vegetation, warming, for example, can actually lead to a greater carbon sink on land. And that's some of the basis of trying, some of the difficulty of trying to figure out what the net effect is of changes in climate, for example. But we do know on the whole that there's been greater net carbon storage in terrestrial ecosystems.